Bonjour, et on commence la rentrée avec, une, avec un invité d'exception, Sir John Haggerty. Thank you. Um, well, good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming so early in the morning. I know France works at a different way to the UK, so uh, this is obviously very early. Um, I, uh, uh, I thought I would talk a little bit about some thoughts from my book, but I, I think there are lo lots of things I'm going to say, and there are lots of things I'm going to say, and please disagree with them, all right? I hate it when people say to me afterwards, well, I disagree with that. Well, I'm going to say things that you may not agree with, uh, and I think that's great. Uh, uh, the idea that we can all agree about everything, I think, is just ridiculous. Um, but I'm going to make three points today. Uh, three points that I think um, are, for me, fundamentally important. And I think actually are fundamentally important for you if you are uh, in the creative, a creative profession. Now, I presume most of you are in advertising, some of you might be in design, but this applies whether in architecture, wh whatever. And my very first point, uh, and it's, it's just so, so important, is as a creative person, you have to have a philosophy. You have to have something you believe in. And if you don't believe in it, if you don't believe in a kind of work, a style of work, a point of view in your work, you will never be a great creative person. It doesn't mean to say if you have a belief, you will be a great creative person, of course, but if you don't believe in something, then you will never be truly, truly great. And you've got to decide what that is. You've got to decide what is your philosophy, what is your point in coming into uh, 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 the creative world? Why are you doing it? You're not just doing it to make money. Money's the last reason you should do anything. Uh, we all know that quote about, you know, money is the root of all evil, which of course is not the quote. The quote is the love of money is the root of all evil. And it's from the Bible, so, you know. Um, God usually is right. Not that I really believe in lots of what he says, but, you know. Um, so that's my first point. You must have a philosophy. And mine, I developed. And it isn't something that you sit down and start when you come into the industry and go, this is what I believe in. You develop it, you evolve it, you have a point of view about it. I got to a point of view, and it was, and it was just, I was asked once, this is a long time ago, to give a talk on what I looked for in a great idea and as a creative director. And, and I, I sort of went, well, sort of things I like, really, uh, which I thought would have made a very short speech. So I had to th sit down and think about what it, what it was that I liked about an idea. What did I think was great about it? Why did it resonate with me? And I realized when I was looking at my work and the work that inspired me, that actually it was irreverence. I loved irreverence. I loved the idea of it. And, and actually, in this speech, um, because I was, I was lucky, I went to art school and from art school to design school and from design school into, into advertising. I did a bit of, had to do a bit of art history. And you realize that, that art moved from being reverent to being irreverent. You know, so the Renaissance period, you know, Leonardo, all those people were paid to make people believe. Believe in God, believe in the state, believe in the church, believe in whatever it was. And gradually, as society developed and evolved, and we began to challenge authority, we began to say, I don't believe in that. I have a different point of view. As knowledge spread, so did irreverence. And it's a powerful force, a powerful force in creativity, a powerful force in communication. So. That's, I got to that, and I looked at all the work that I loved and the work that I'd done, and I realized I had this, this sort of streak of irreverence in it. And that's gone through 
everything that uh, uh, I believed in and everything that BBH has been about. So uh, that's fundamentally important. And I think for all of you, who, whatever you are, if you're an architect, you're a painter, if you're a writer, you have a philosophy. You, have a, you, you can't just come in and be creative. You have to believe in something. Because I think, you know, I always say to people, but people say to me, you know, you're, you're, you're obviously very good, John, and you can stand in the shoes of consumers. And I go, no, bollocks. I, I can't stand in the... I don't, I don't know what somebody in the north of England thinks. I have no idea. In actual fact, I'm not particularly interested. I'm interested in what I think and what I believe in. And I think if you're a great communicator, that's what you do. You do things that you love. And that way you become great. You know, a painter doesn't sit down and go, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint a picture. You know, Picasso didn't go down and say, hmm, now what do people in Lille really like? You know, I've got to think about this because, you know, I'm doing this painting. And do they like lots of blue? Maybe I should put more blue in it or maybe a bit yellow. That's quite nice. They quite like that. He did what he loved. And in a way, that's what you've got to do. You've got to do what you love. And it's fundamental. And if you say this, you know, the other thing you've got to, you, you realize is that when you work in advertising, you, you go into meetings and you hear people say things in meetings and you think, we don't really believe in that because we're saying things that we think clients want to hear. And it's rubbish. You know, it's, I sit in meetings sometimes at BBH and I go, no, we don't believe in that. That's absolutely not true. But, you know, they're in there saying, yes, we do that. I tell you one, the, the, the one thing I always love is that one about, um, it might be a bit hard, this, if you go walk into an advertising agency uh, as a client, I guarantee you the agency says, well, we have consumer understanding. I bet you, right? I bet you've heard that phrase. We have consumer understanding. And you think to yourself, God, they've got consumer understanding. You know, them and God, you know, they can understand what consumers are. It's rubbish. You do not have consumer understanding. What you have is consumer knowledge. And that's the difference. You have consumer knowledge. So what you do with that knowledge then determines how good you are. But we constantly say things to our clients which aren't true because we think clients want to hear it. And that way, I believe failure operates. You will fail. Because the most fundamental thing you can do in advertising is tell the truth. And the truth is the most powerful strategy you can employ. All the best work I've done has been basically telling people the truth. Now, what you have to do is find a funny way of doing it, an engaging way of doing it. So that's important. I've drifted a bit here. So one, find a philosophy. Two, if you're a creative person, you've got to expect that you're only going to have 10 years. It's always a bit of a hush when you say that, because I can look at people and think, shit, my 10 years is just up. I've been in the business nine and a half. I better get another job. Maybe a cafe, work as a waiter. I don't know. But if you think about it, now why this is, this is very, very important. If you, you know, in most creative industries, if you look at anybody, music, painting, whatever it is you look at, people have about 10 years when they do their great work. And then they go on repeating it. So, you know, you think, you know, Mick Jagger can go around the world singing Jumping Jack Flash uh, and 30,000 people turn up and applaud. Well, they, they wrote that in 1968. Imagine you coming in with, well, most of you weren't born in 1968. I was. I was working in advertising. But imagine you've come in and you've presented an idea you had in 1968. You get laughed at. And the reason I say this is that Advertising is probably the most creative industry you can work in. And the reason for that is you have to come in every day and have a new idea. And that idea can't be like yesterday's idea. It's got to be a new idea. So you burn out very, very quickly. And that's fine, you know. I'm a great lover of, I don't know if you know, Francis Bacon, the painter. I think he's fantastic. I love his work. But, you know, I always have this, in, this sort of vision in my head of, you know, he's now dead, of course, but, you know, he's done his latest painting and he's gone in to see his agent. He said, look, I've got another painting. 
And his agent has looked at it and he's gone, oh, Francis, oh, no, not another twisted face. Oh, please, can't you just go out into the countryside and do a nice watercolour or something, get some sun or something? But he could go on doing that. He could go on repeating that idea, that thought, because what you do if you're someone like that is you keep exploring a thought. We don't do that. We come in and every day we have a new idea. And if you don't have a new idea, you won't succeed. Now, so the question is, the question is, how do you take a 10-year career and turn it into a 15-year career, into a 20-year career, into a 25-year career? That's the answer. Um, of course, um, there are three things I would say. One, um, constantly, constantly, constantly be aware. You're always looking. You're always observing. You're always engaging. Because in a way, a creative person is a kind of cipher. You know, things come in and they go out. And that's why you're expressing yourself when you have a great idea. It's an expression. You know, creativity, I define creativity as an expression of self. It's you. That's your idea. It's come from you. It's what you believe in. So fundamentally important to stay fresh that you're looking all the time. Always looking. Always, you read everything. You read as much as you can. You see as much as you can. You walk around observing as much as you can. First thing. Second thing, never become a cynic. Cynicism is the death of creativity. And I've watched it happen. I've watched people become cynics. I've watched them, and they lose their creativity. And my third thing, which relates to the first thing, is if you walk around as a creative person with a pair of earphones, listening to your music as you're walking down the street, you are cutting yourself off from observation. So every time I see one of my creative people walk in with the headphones on, I fucking rip the headphones off and say, what are you doing? You're not listening, you're not hearing, you're not watching. You're putting yourself in a bubble. Great creative people do not put themselves in bubbles. They actually are constantly engaged in the world. And as soon as you cut that off, you diminish, you lower as a creative person. So those are my, my three things. So, the, so um, fundamentally important that to sort of maintain your, your creativity. But the chances are, you'll have 10 years, and it's up to you. My third point that I wanted to say today is you can't have a creative company unless creative people are at the top of it. And you can't have a creative, if you believe that this is a creative industry, which I do, then creative people have got to be at the very top of the company. You know, when Walt Disney set up Walt Disney, he was an animator. And he made brilliant, brilliant, brilliant films. Made brilliant films. As soon as he died, when he died, and it was taken over by producers, the quality of what they, went, they, they produced went down. It's a very simple thing. Sometimes it's essential that we just talk about simple things. You cannot have a creative company, a creative philosophy, unless creative people are at the top of that company. So I say to all of you here, you know, one of my criticisms of creative people is you don't take responsibility. You know, you've got to be at the top. You've got to be driving the company. Your voice has got to be at that boardroom, the top of that boardroom, making your point. And if you're not, then that company will never really be creative. It will pretend to be creative. You know, if you want an accountant to run your company, then that's fine. But, you know, you've got to take responsibility. So those are my three things. A creative philosophy. Um, remember, you're going to have probably just 10 years, so what are you going to do about it? And thirdly, take control. Creative people have got to be at the top of companies. So um, I'm just going to... I, I don't know, it's going on a bit, really, aren't I? Uh, that's all right. Uh, I just thought I'd take you through a, a, a quick uh, trip through uh, what I've done and some work. Um, I always, I, I start off by sort of showing, oh thanks. I, by the way, um, I, I told this story last night, I cannot talk and do technology at the same time. 
just doesn't work. And uh, I, was, I was reminded, I reminded the story last night. If anybody, you, who likes B.B. King? You know B.B. King, you know, blues player? He cannot sing and play guitar at the same time, right? So I, it's true, this is absolutely true. So I'm in very good company. I don't talk and do technology at the same time. Yeah. But yeah, Freddie, yeah. <laughs> I don't think you'd want that, actually, me singing. So if I could play this, and I, I think you know what's wonderful about our industry, what I love about it. I love that sort of sense of reduction, the power of reduction, the power of taking a, a very complicated thought and reducing it down to kind of 30, 40, 60 seconds, whatever it might be. I love that. I think that's, the ge that's our genius. Um, and I think it's just absolutely brilliant. And I love the fact that 60 seconds can not only change your life, it can change the fortunes of a brand. I think that's so exciting. That's, that is the power that you have. The power to change the fortunes of a brand. And if we could just play this, this is change the fortunes of, became rather famous, uh, of this company that you may have heard of, I'm sure. Sorry, the sound is it's not coming across. But anyway, what, there are a couple of things about that which I love. You know, I say this thing, advertising is 80% idea and it's 80% execution. And that's the great conundrum. You know, how can it be 80% idea and 80% execution? That makes 160%. That, even I know that doesn't work. But it, that's, that's the great thing about what we do. And, you know, when you... When you sort of, you know, people talk about ideas. An idea isn't an idea until it's been made. An idea is only a theory until it has been made, because it's in the making that it happens. And I always love to sort of say, you know, there's been this thing of uh, crowdsourcing, which is, you know, something that a lot of people have talked about. Hey, maybe creativity could be done by crowdsourcing or sitting at some brainstorming or something like that, which is absolute. Again, bollocks, you know, brainstorming. I mean, please, you know. You know, it's a great, I, I always think that lovely thing about creativity isn't an occupation. It's a preoccupation. You know, you don't come in at 10 o'clock on a Monday morning and be creative. You're creative all the time. The idea that you can suddenly, it's like a switch, you turn on and off. It's a nonsense. So I love the fact that with that, you know, you think about it. If I said to you, I've got this brilliant idea, absolutely fantastic idea. It's a man walks into a laundrette. He takes off his T-shirt. He puts some stones into a washing machine, takes off his jeans, puts that into the washing machine, and sits down next to a great big fat man. You'd go, yeah. <laughs> so I'd, I'd say it's brilliant. This is brilliant. This will change the fortunes of a brand. You'd throw me out, wouldn't you? You wouldn't buy it. But only through belief and understanding was I able to sell it. I was able to say, this will be transformative. That is, I think, a fantastic example of 60 seconds that changed the fortunes of a brand, changed the fortunes of an agency, changed my career, and actually is an idea that represents what television is all about, emotion. It's emotion. You know. All information goes in through the heart always remember that. So that's why I, I love telling that. There's one other story about that, which I, I love. Do you, do you have, in France, do you, when you submit commercials, does it have to go through an authority or something? Yeah, 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 we have the same thing in the UK. When we wrote that script, I had the man getting down to a pair of what we used to call Y fronts, you know, little things like that. And of course, they read the script and they said, no, we, we can't, you know, can't have this, can't do this. And we said, why? 
So it's indecent, you know, a man undressing naked, but he's got a pair of Y fronts on. And I said, no, sorry. And we went backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And it was a real impasse, and we were fighting and arguing and everything like that. And they, <coughs> eventually, they, they came back and they said to us, look, if you put him in a pair of boxer shorts, that will be okay. And we kind of went, so remember this is 1985, it's a long time ago. Um, and we went, boxer shorts? That's sort of that dodgy American underwear that they used to wear in the 1940s. Well, you know. But we thought, well, you know, if that's the case, then we'll put him in boxer shorts. We did, and the sale of boxer shorts went completely <laughs> through the roof. So, you know, and Calvin Klein, founded his underwear uh, uh, company on the basis of what the authorities in the UK said about what is decent and indecent. So you see, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes authority has something good to say. But anyway, um, so here, you know, I, I briefly said I got into advertising, I, I went to art school and from art school I was very fortunate, I had really great teachers who looked at me and said, John, you seem to be more about ideas I don't think you're going to be the next Picasso. It did come as a sort of a bit of a blow, because I really felt I was going to be the next Picasso. Um, and from, uh, so I went to design school, and from design school, I was shown uh, the great work of this man here, which I'm sure we all know. If I just press this, does this go forward? Yeah. I mean, we all know this work, and I won't go on about it. But I think what, you know, I love about it is, is that, and again, brilliant example of irreverence, Fantastic example of, uh, uh, you know, using humour and telling the truth. I mean, I think we have to admit that Bill Burnback invented what I call modern advertising. Uh, that thinking that went into it is just genius. Um, there's a lovely story about that, actually, that, that most people forget. And this, this is what happens um, with advertising. Sometimes the context of the idea is lost over time. We just look at it and go... We think it's all about American consumerism and they had big cars and this was saying think small, which it partly is. But it was explained to me at the time they ran this campaign, IBM was running a huge campaign saying think big. And it, we were really just bouncing off that. But it worked, over time it worked. But I think, I, I love it because, you know, what does it say? It says it encapsulates everything that we, we should be believing in find an interesting way of telling the truth. Um, and I got my very first piece of work that went into uh, DNAD was uh, this for El Al, for the Israeli airline. Uh, and they were running ads saying, you know, you should come to Israel because it's very sunny and you'll get a suntan. We were saying to them, but, you know, you can do that by going to Spain. You've got something else to sell. And again, we, uh, we kind of said, you know, it's, it's about the Bible. You know, it's a fantastic opportunity to sell something original. But you know what happens to you? Even when you get a client to buy that, they always come back and they say, yeah, no, we really like it, John, but, you know, we really do want an ad that talks about sunshine. And you go, oh, God. But we said, well, actually, we, there is always a way. Always remember, as a creative person, there's always a way you can get around something like that. And, of course, it was very obvious the way around it for, for that was... Uh, yeah, Noah, and saying, yes, it has been known to rain in Israel. So we talked about sunshine through Noah. Um, one other thing I've always, uh, I've always been, so I got turned on to advertising by that great Burnback work. Uh, I did that back in, well, a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I say to people, I get, often get asked, when did you come into advertising? And, you know, the truth is 1965, you know. So it's so long ago. It's, it, I, I usually make the joke, I used to make the joke round about the time that Gutenberg invented movable type. And that joke worked up until about 2000, you know. And then I was talking to some students and I made that joke and I, they all, I could see them looking at me and going, Who, who's Gutenberg? <laughs> and what, what's movable type? You know? What is this man? Where's this man come from? So my new joke is, round about the time, you know, uh, we paid for music and water was free. <laughs> so that's my new joke. It works in the UK, it doesn't work, because you've always paid for water, haven't you? But, you know, we haven't, you know. So the other thing I love to say is that you, you know when, um, 
You know that thing, when somebody says to you, when do you know an idea is great, apart from this holy reverence? And you know that, I always have that thing about, um, you know when an idea is great that somebody else has done, but you hate it. You know that? You absolutely hate it. Because you think, shit, why didn't I do that? That's absolutely brilliant. And I remember I was uh, working with um, Charles Saatchi, and we were working on some uh, projects for... Uh, uh, health education, and one of them was about contraception. We were working on this thing for talking about contraception to, to young people. And we'd all had this brief, and uh, I'd come up with what I thought was the killer idea. I'd done it, I cracked it, you know that thing? And I had a picture of a sort of 14-year-old schoolgirl in the school uniform who was sort of eight months pregnant, and it just said, who taught your daughter the facts of life, right? And I thought, that's it, I've done it. And um, Jeremy Sinclair, who was a writer there, time, just sidled up to me and said, John, I've had this idea. I don't know, what, what do you think of it? And I looked at it and I hated it. I hated it so much that I knew it was great. And this was the idea he had. And it just simply says, would you be more careful if it was you that got pregnant? And, you know, genius. I thought, just genius. And actually, it became a kind of uh, a symbol in the 70s of the changing sexual attitudes in, in the UK. You know, amazing, really, when you think it's a bloke with a pillow stuffed up his jumper. I mean, I think that's incredible. Um, but I think the other thing, too, at that time, we were doing lots of, lots of interesting work. One of the things I always say to creative people, that th you know that thing I talked about, about you know, look, learn, watch, see, everything around you. And we were given a, a little, it was a, just a little project to, to work on food hygiene. You know, it was a little poster we had to do for them. And um, for the Health Education Council, these people here. And we, we were reading everything we could about food hygiene. And we came up with this idea. This was the poster. And it's going to be hard for you to read this, but actually, sorry, it is, but it, it, if you read from the third line, it says flies, you know, bzz, can't eat solid food, so to soften it up, they vomit on it, like that. And then they stamp the vomit in, uh, usually until it's a liquid, a few, and just stamping in a few germs for good measure. Then, when it's good and runny, you know, bzz, they suck it all back again, probably dropping some excrement at the same time. That's what a fly does. And do you know what's great about that? Is that came out of a government leaflet. And all we did was we lifted it, we put on the top, this is what happens when a fly lands on your food. And then we added, and then when they finished eating, it's your turn. So you kind of go, isn't that, you know, information is everywhere. You know, that thing, absorb it, take it in, look at it, you know. It's all around you. You've just, you know, as a communicator, you've got to be aware of it. Um, I, I so sort of had the uh, pleasure of working with um, Charles Sar Charles Archie was the first copywriter I worked with. And um, I remember I came into, as I said, 1965, and I was a young, you know, then you were an assistant art director, you weren't even an art director. And uh, the creative director came into me and said, oh, John, I've found a copywriter for you to work with. I thought, oh, that's great, really, art director, copywriter. And um, I said, so what's his name? And he went, Charles Saatchi. And I went, oh, God. He's Italian. <laughs> Therefore, he lives at home with his mother, all right? <laughs> and thirdly, he won't be able to spell, you know? <laughs> Just my luck, you know? That's what I get. Just, you know, I could see my career going like, broom, like that. Oh, no. Well, actually, I was right on two fronts. He did live at home with his mum. And he wasn't very good at spelling. <laughs> he nearly got fired for a spelling mistake in an ad. But he was actually a brilliant, brilliant writer. And he was a brilliant... And I learned a lot from Charlie about kind of... Always keep thinking, keep thinking, keep thinking. Never give up. Never, 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 never give up.
And uh, I always remember, and I'm going to show this, this story. There was a story. We, when we started Saatchi and Saatchi back in 1970, we... We were always looking for stories, trying to get a story. Had to get in the newspapers, had to be in the press, had to get PR, had to do that. And we would always kind of, you know, win a new piece of business or we would, you know, publish a new piece of work we'd done. Um, and there was a period of time we had no new business and we had no new work. And, and we hadn't been in the press for about a month. So it was really driving everybody mad and Charlie especially. So what he did was he said, right, I'm going to invent a story. I will make a story. This is why he's a brilliant publicist and now probably one of the world's greatest collectors of art. And so he said, I know what I'm going to do to underline the kind of creativity of Saatchi and Saatchi. I'm going to insure the creative department for a million pounds. All right? So that was 1970, 72 actually. I mean, a million pounds. We were all insured for a million pounds. And he then said, I'm, I'm going to set up a transfer fee, just like in football. So that if you wanted to take somebody out of, B, uh, out of um, Saatchi and Saatchi, you had to pay a transfer fee. And he got a picture taken. This is us. That's me. <laughs> I don't, don't look at the shoes, all right? Don't forget the shoes, right? There's Charlie. There, that's right. There's Jeremy Sinclair, who wrote the, the ad I hated, you know. And, but what, do you know what's brilliant about that? <clears throat> He got that story onto the back page of the, of the Sunday Times Business News. Sunday Times is a huge Sunday newspaper in the UK. And there it is. You know, October the 8th, 1972. The price on their heads. You know? So he never stopped thinking. He never stopped promotion, promotion, promotion. It was fundamentally important to him. Brilliant, I think. And, you know, for those of you who are going to set up your agency or set up your company... How do you promote it? What are you going to do? What are you going to say? How are you going to underline what you believe in? Yeah. Uh, and that was a great lesson I learned uh, from Charlie. Um, flipping forward, this became um, one of the first ads that, that we did for Levi's, that we won the business, and they came to us and they said, look, we want you to do a very quickly a poster campaign for us because we were introducing black denim, black Levi's, and... Uh, so I did this for them, and we went to sell it, and, and they looked at it, and they said, but where, where are the picture of the jeans? <laughs> and we said, you don't need a picture of jeans. People know what jeans look like. We want to emphasize they're black and what that means. And they said, look, this is, this is ridiculous. I mean, it's just, there's no picture of jeans. And we kept arguing with them, and they kind of went, Oh, God, we've just hired these lunatics. They won't even put a picture of a pair of jeans in, in the poster. What are we going to do? And time was running out. You know, posters then, you had to get them printed and put up. And uh, in the end, they went, look, we've just got to run with it. We've just got to go with it. They ran it. And obviously, it got a tremendous amount of applause. And what happened is that the uh, chairman of Levi's in San Francisco, a man called Robert Haas, who is the great, great, grandson of Levi Strauss saw it <clears throat> and had it framed and put in his office and said this is what this company should be about and to thank me for forcing them to run it Levi's gave me a black sheep which is in my office <laughs> to this day and the, my point about telling this story is that then we realized and adopted it as our symbol which is why we have a black sheep going in that direction as opposed to going in that direction so the point of that story is your culture comes out of what you do. We didn't sit down on day one at BBH and say, hey, we're going to be the black sheep of the advertising industry and we're going to do it. It emerged. It came out of us. But we were listening to what we were doing and watching what we were doing. And I always say to people, you know, do interesting things and interesting things will happen to you. Just keep doing interesting things and they will happen to you. So your culture emerges. It comes out of... Something that you've done, something that you've said, whatever it might be. Um, I always love showing this because, this next one, because, uh, you know, again, irreverence. And I always think, you know, when you get a problem from a client, they will, they will come to you with certain prejudices. They will come to you with a prejudice. And they say, for instance, we won this, uh, it was a cat food account in the UK. And they came to us and they said, you must 
show a, pe a pet. You know, you've got to have a picture of a pet in a, in a pet food ad. Got to, must do it. You can't, you know, it's got to work. You couldn't do that, you know, that fine for jeans, but, you know. And then we went, okay, but if we do that, it'll look like every other cat food ad we've ever done. So we said, all right, we're going to put a pet into a cat food ad. And we did. Uh, and what we did is we did this. And it says, when I grow up, I want to be a cat. And it said, just for choosy cats. So <laughs> when I presented it to the client, I said, I've listened very carefully to everything that you've said, because you are obviously very, very wise. And here is the solution. So they couldn't turn it down, which I love that. <laughs> hmm. But again, you know, look at that irreverence all the time. Irreverence, irreverence. Um, I'm going to flip through some things. I want to show a bit more TV. I'm going to go through that. Oh, this is <clears throat> an account I worked on. I, I worked with some... We had a conversation yesterday about the lack of women in creative departments. And it is a real mystery why that should be. I was, I've been very lucky and I've worked with some wonderful um, female creatives. <clears throat> and this was... I worked with a, a wonderful writer called Barbara Noakes. Barbara was a... A brilliant writer, and, and all the men in the room will not understand this ad, all right? You, you, men, you will have not have an idea of what's going on here, but don't worry. This ad is, direct, is for sanitary protection. Oh, don't do that. <clears throat> and uh, I worked with Barbara on this, and I learned a huge amount from listening to her talk about it. And again, what she said is, uh, there used to be a joke, and I'll tell you the joke. When we won this piece of business, there was the, the, the little joke was uh, a mother says to her son of eight years old, you know, uh, Johnny, it's your birthday coming up. What would you like for your birthday? And the little boy goes, oh, I think I'd like a packet of tampons. <laughs> and the mother, What? He says, yeah, a packet of tampons. And I said, what, what, why do you want a packet of tampons? He said, well, I want to go skydiving, hang gliding. I'm going to go scuba diving, skiing. Because he'd seen all the ads for tampons, and that's what everybody did. When you had a period, women wanted to go skydiving. <clears throat> and Barbara said, John, this is not true. You do not want to do any of that. Far from it, you know. And so we said, you know, and she wrote this line, and I have to say, it was just genius. The only time in my life that I've actually sort of realized I needed a special education to work on a piece of business. And it's just, have you ever wondered how men would carry on if they had periods? And I remember when we presented, I haven't got all the ads here, but I show some of them in my book. <clears throat> we presented all this work naturally, to a group of men, you know, isn't that brilliant? Men dealing with, you know, marketing men. And they were just completely perplexed about the whole thing. They, they couldn't even respond to it. They insisted that it all go into research because they thought research would completely blow it out and that would be it. And it's the only time in my life when I applauded research. And we put it into research and everything Barbara said came back full 100% and they ran it. So, you know, it, it, I just love that story, actually. I don't know why I'm telling it, really. It's good. But brilliant working with... You know, I think the point about that story is when, you know, and I think it's a great shame there aren't more women in creative departments. It's a mystery, as I've said. Why is that? I don't know. But when you work with somebody who's very different from you, I think it's brilliant because you're, you're you know, you're constantly <clears throat> getting people rubbing up against each other and saying interesting things and coming with a different point of view. You know, it really disappoints me when I hear, you know, sometimes you get this, I don't know creative people here, they come in and see me, we, we've got new people coming in, and they say, I say to them, so um, <clears throat> who's the art director, who's the writer? And they go, well, we sort of do both. And I go, oh, oh, right. I have two answers to that. And I say, first of all, I say, so um, if I don't like the art direction, who do I kick? <laughs> and I can't kick two people at once. It's really very difficult. I've tried. It doesn't work. And I then say, so decide. I then say, 
You know, and the other thing is, I have never, ever, 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 ever <clears throat> seen one painting that Shakespeare did. Not one. Not one. I've looked, Googled it, not done. Picasso, not one book. Not one. Not even a poem. Didn't, you know, nothing. So I think, you know, would you please decide what it is that you want to do and do it? And I think, um, you know, it's very important, the brilliance of putting an art director and a writer together, which again, was, we go back to Mr. Birnbach, was that you're putting two different people together. You're putting together somebody who thinks visually and somebody who thinks verbally, who thinks in terms of narrative. And it's those, that tension there that creates an interesting team. So when people walk in and say, hey, we do both, kick them out and say, decide what you want to do and do it. And I think there's a huge danger today. My, my wariness of, of today, and I do think today, it, it, you know, this is the most exciting time to be in advertising. There's no question about that. It is a fantastic time to be in advertising. The golden age wasn't in the 80s or the 70s or the 60s. The golden age will be now. And people will look back and say it must have been genius to be around when digital uh, technology was invented and created. Wasn't that fantastic? <clears throat> and you've got a, a chance to do that. But, you know, the point about it is we need people who are specialists. We need great writers. We need great art directors. We need people who understand how to make something look and feel brilliant. The idea of being a generalist, I think, is a nonsense. And I hear it, you know, because of the digital revolution. Hey, I want somebody who can do everything. No. I want somebody who's absolutely fantastic at doing one thing. I will pull it all together. I will make sure it works across everything else because I'll, I'll get different people to work on it. But this arrogance, arrogance that our industry has, that somehow as creative people, we can do it all. You know, no other industry, no other creative industry would do that. Steven Spielberg does not do theater. He does film. Quentin Tarantino does not work on radio plays. He writes film scripts. You know, we believe we can do it all. And we're genius at it all. And well, we're not. You know, and we've got to learn that actually one of the reasons why I believe the quality of creative work has diminished over the last 15 years, and it's, there's empirical evidence, it's not my opinion, it's actually the people we're talking to out there are saying the quality of advertising has diminished. So what are you going to do about it? One of the things you've got to do about it is to get people who are really good at doing one thing, who are brilliant art directors, who are brilliant copywriters, who are brilliant digital specialists. You stitch them all together as creative directors, but be great at one thing. And I think it's, a, it's an absurdity. You know, I always thought it was ridiculous that we could go from being you know, great at doing posters, great at doing television, great at doing radio, great at doing print, and now you look at it, you know, what we're expected to be great at, is ridiculous, it's absurd. And that's one of the reasons why I believe the quality of work has diminished. And I look at all the best people that have worked in our industry, certainly in the UK, and they, they without realizing it, they were great at either writing print or they were great at television or, or they were great at doing posters or whatever it might be. And that's what we've got to rediscover and not believe that everybody can do everything else. You know, it's just ridiculous. That was a rant, by the way. In English, a rant, you know. <laughs> you may not agree with it, good, good, good. I wanna show you something else. Let me just keep going forward here. Um, uh, you know, I wanna show this one, Freddie, actually. I tell you, you know, I talk about, um, I've always, you know, whenever I've done work, I, I, I don't want, I've never actually wanted to work in advertising. I've always wanted to make work that's outside of advertising that's viewed very differently. And I've used influences all around us, but sometimes you get caught out. And uh, if we could just play this one for me, it's that one there. And you'll realize we did this in 1984 for Levi's.
course, you know, you, you run that to kids today and they go, what? Smuggling genes into Russia. What? what? You get Chanel in Russia, don't you? You know, I mean, what's the problem? So, of course, history <coughs> catches you out. History changes and things don't become relevant anymore. But, you know, I think it's really important that we use the influences around us. You don't want to make advertising... You don't want your work to live in a world called advertising. It should live in the real world. It should be drawing from out there. Now, I, because I, we want to ask some questions. I want to show you one last thing, which I absolutely adore. Um, and it was done by a brilliant creative team who worked for us, who now have an agency here in Paris called Fred and Farid. Bit controversial. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and uh, I'll just get to it. It's here. If you can just play this one. I, you know what I love about this? This is a philosophy of life in 60 seconds. This is everything about life. So there you go, life is short, play more, all right? Listen, I, I, I realize that I've drifted on a bit. We, we said um, 15 minutes for questions. Um, so thank you for listening, thank you. I hope you disagree with something I say. Thanks a lot, Sir John. Questions? No questions, because it was such a brilliant talk. <laughs> Absolutely none whatsoever. <laughs> Covered it everything off. Meaning of life. Meaning of life. I would, in fact, like you to, if you don't mind, share the story of the best brand that you shared with us yesterday. Oh, yeah. The, uh, well, if you... Yes, when I, you were asked what, what is the best brand in your view. Okay. I was in... Uh, <clears throat> when we set our office up in New York, I went over to New York and lived there for two and a half years. And uh, so I spent two and a half years in America. And uh, I was invited to this uh, creative advertising conference. And I was on a panel with some top American creative people. And the question came from the audience, so what is the greatest brand? And I let them go first, because I thought, well, American, I'll let them talk. And so, you know, somebody talked about Coca-Cola, genius brand, fizzy water, nothing else, but, you know, built on brilliant marketing. Somebody else talked about Nike. They thought Nike was one of the great brands. And somebody else said Volkswagen because of, they invented modern advertising. And they talked a little bit. And they came to me and they said, so John, what do you think is the greatest brand? And I said, well, I don't think any of those are the greatest brands. Actually, the greatest brand is the Catholic Church. At which point there was a sort of, you know, I could feel the air taken out of the room. And I said, well, you know, I said, what do you mean? And I said, well, think about it. The world's greatest logo, isn't it? I mean, brilliant logo. Just like that. Done it. <laughs> people make the sign of the logo, you know. They do that with the swoosh, but, you know, not as many people as do it with the sign of the cross. Brilliant. And I said, you know, greatest brand ever. First one to go global. Instantly went global. Brilliant. Went to seven-day openings, fantastic. You know, none of this closing on Sunday that you have here with shops. They went seven-day opening. We ain't stopping. Um, location, 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 as they say. <laughs> Center of the town, biggest, biggest building in the town, you know. Just like, you know, now Apple, biggest store you can go to. Just fantastic. Um, of course, you know, they diversified. They did christenings, weddings, funerals, you know, the whole bloody lot, you know. You want it, we do it. You come here. And, uh, and of course, you know, at its height, you know, when it was genius. I mean, you know, 
Nike launched Just Do It with uh, uh, a John Lennon song. Well, you know, okay, John Lennon. But, you know, the church had Bach, you know, Beethoven, Mozart, you know, think of all the great composers that worked for them and the artists who worked for them. You know, they had all the best artists, you know. So here was a brand, a fantastic brand, lasted 2,000 years, still going, had a few bits of competition from those Presbyterians and Protestants and stuff like that, but, pff, you know, saw them off, you know, where are they? And, of course, the genius of it is they were selling trust. Trust me. They weren't selling a physical product. It's trust. Believe in me and you'll go to heaven. And increasingly, a very interesting book, it's worth reading, it's called um, Living on Thin Air, The New Economy. And increasingly, we're selling things that you can't see. You know, if you work for a mobile phone uh, company, you know, a provider, you're selling vibrating air. I can't see Vodafone. I can't, I can't hold them. I can't. So you have to trust in them. I, were, I use a, 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 an online bank. I can't see them. I tr have to trust them that they're there, that they've got my money. There's no building. And increasingly, we're selling things that you can't see. I can't see Google. You know, it appears on the screen, but it's electronic. I can't see it. So increasingly, we're selling things that you can't see. Church got there 2,000 years ago. Still going strong. So there it was. Anyway, you know, it was a dangerous moment doing that in America. That was it. But I like that. No, obviously. Oh, there's a question. That young lady there. Oops. Oh, there we go. Hello. Hello. I'm Fanny. Um, thanks a lot for this very inspiring speech. It was fantastic. Hopefully, I disagree <laughs> with uh, this uh, specialist, be a specialist, never a generalist. You quote Shakespeare, Picasso, but in France we love to, to quote uh, Gainsbourg, Cocteau, Pagnol, doing different arts. Uh, but this is not my question. My question is for all of us. What should we say to our boss or to our clients uh, when we present a creative idea and they say, hey, please, don't bullshit me. Uh, we are not a creative company, what should we say? What should we respond? <clears throat> well, I think if, if somebody says that to you, then you're in a very depressing place. <laughs> <laughs> because you have to say to them, well, I, I worry for your future, because the future is going to be creative. Uh, and if brands don't embrace creativity, at some point in time, they will collapse and fail. And creativity, is only trying to get somebody to take notice of what it is you're saying. It's trying to stand out from the crowd. And I've always said, you know, and I have, I, it isn't said to me quite like that. And I go, I present an idea and a client, this is what you get in the UK. You get, the client looks at it and goes, well, it's always that intake of breath, which, you know, you, and they say, oh, that's very, very different. And I go, Oh, is that, a, is that a problem? And they go, well, it's very difficult. I say, well, look, so you want something the same as everybody else? Well, I didn't, look, I can come back in five minutes with that. Just stay there and I'll, come, I'll go out and I'll come back with something just like everybody else. No, 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 I don't mean that. I don't mean that. I don't want this. I say, this is why difference is powerful. The power of difference means that you get people to listen. They reawaken their interest in you by being different. You keep saying the same thing, people stop listening. So I don't, I think, you know, the thing I learned in America is don't use the word creative. It really is, it, I promise you, don't you, if you say creative, they think, oh, he's going to do some of that edgy stuff. You know, edgy. <gasps> Get him out. Oh, we don't want that. You know. So you have to use different words. And I think you, you must stop using the word creative. Start saying to them, I'm trying to get people to watch and to listen and pay attention to what you're saying. Don't talk about creativity. Because if once you use the word creative with certain people, who was it? It was Goebbels who said, every time I hear the word creative, I reach for my revolver. You know, nice man. <laughs> but, you know, you're using the wrong words. 
One of the skills in selling things is use the terminology of that person, not your terminology. And that way you might get them to go, oh, I understand, yeah. You've got to make sure that you're, they feel you're on their side. You're, not, you're just being creative. Well, you would be, wouldn't you, because you are. So if you use that word, you're dead. Oh, there was a, a gentleman back there. I tell you what, he, that gentleman had his hand up first, so we'll go there. <laughs> yeah, it's me. Well, um, first of all, I think that uh, it was a pretty good presentation because um, it's pretty early for me and I'm still awake, which is <laughs> good value. So am I. Yeah, <laughs> good for I've you. I've done it about 45 times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, I've got, um, it's not kind of a question, it's more like a um, I don't like a conclusion of, yeah. I mean, I'm a young art director, because I won't say creative, but um, <laughs> You the can use the word here, where, you know, we're yeah, a, between friends. We're in a, you can yeah. use it, we understand it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Glad. Uh, the problem is that, um, the first thing that they said to me when I went into this business was that creative person are not artists. We don't make art, we make creative things. We do sell things. We are in advertising. We're here to sell what our clients need to sell. And the way you present things and we, you show us things today um, is actually uh, the exact opposite. Meaning, I do some artist stuff, but on the side, meaning that's private. And when I'm selling things to uh, my creative director, meaning more on the line to the clients and maybe sometimes to the customers, but um, on the line, everything we are presenting, or every idea that we have, must be first for our clients, because he's going to sell, he's, mean, he's going to buy that idea for him. So anyway, when I'm thinking of an idea, I'm thinking, OK, what will he react to what I'm going to say? Anyway, so on the line, every time, every time that we have a great idea, we must sell to one person first, and then a thousand of it. Mm. But every time, you know, it's just <coughs> one thing at a time. And being an artist is um, too, I mean, that's too different from our kind of job, Scott. What will you do? It's only for you, anyway, okay? Um, I have a vision, I have something that I want to show to the world, okay? Now, that's meaning the way we see things, meaning now. Um, is kind of different, slightly different. Meaning yeah. that um, any time that we sell something, we have to think to the ones that's going to buy it anyway. I mean, if yeah, we are I selling yogurt, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I understand. But first of all, I would, I would uh, thank you. A very good question. Power of reduction. You know, make it shorter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> first thing you got to learn. You got. You know, I, I slightly disagree. When people say to me, um, you, I firmly believe you are doing the work that you love. And you've got to stick to that because that's you, all right? And, that, and otherwise you will not succeed. When people say to me, oh, you know, that creative stuff, I say, do you realize how much, as a brand, Picasso is worth today? And it's worth going and calculating. Do it yourself. Any artist you, any great artist you like, Andy Warhol. Calculate how much Andy Warhol, an artist, as a brand, is worth today. And I guarantee you, almost guarantee you, that person's worth more than the brand you're working on. <clears throat> That's the first thing to say to somebody. So, because artists were trying to sell things. They were salesmen. You know, they, were, they didn't go out and say, I'm a salesman. They did art, and they tried to make people believe in it. Poor old Vincent van Gogh wasn't. He saw one painting in his life, and that was to his brother. But now, of course, you know, and that was his failure, in a way. Because you're trying, you're trying to change the world as an artist. You're trying to affect people. So you want to, you've got to be able to sell your work. Think about them as brands. And that way, I argue to somebody else, so... I would like, I'd like to have Andy Warhol as a brand worth more than, you know, Darty or whoever you might be working on, you know, worth a lot more, a lot more. For, and value is going up all the time. So that's the first thing to say. Second thing is, I do think this, I've, I've said this, don't use words that you like. Use the words that they understand. Fundamentally important when you're selling something. 
You know, that's crucial. But ultimately, we mustn't veer away from what you're doing is creative. It is about creativity. And never be ashamed of that. And creativity, I always say, is the future. Uh, and if people don't believe in that, leave that agency, leave that company, go somewhere else, set your own company up. That was the only reason I said, in the end, I became a creative director. I didn't want to become a creative director. But I realized I had to take control. So I became a creative director. I'd love to have stayed just doing the work. That's what I love. But I realized I had to take control. So take control. And remember, we've got some wonderful account men here, lovely planners. But ultimately, this business is about ideas. Clients come to you because you can have ideas. That's your job. And that's where the power lies, in the end. So don't be pressed by that. Go and set your own company up. <laughs> One more. There was this gentleman. Yes, hi. Yes. How are you? <coughs> Thank you, John. It's been brilliant. Um, just need an advice from you, from creative director to creative director, just between you and me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, you're a writer I'm, or an art director? I'm a writer. We should get together. Yeah. Art director, writer. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> Just, just a question, and, and I would love to hear how you, you would react to some of the <coughs> problems I face sometimes with those young creatives, like sitting in the back, yeah. <laughs> you know, 20 years old or something. And sometimes they just find an idea that, and I go like, yeah, it's been great, it's been done in 1983, it's been a, you know, it's been a gold lion in Cannes like 23 years ago, it's amazing. And so I can't buy it, you know. But they say, I mean, who cares, you know, it was the 20th century. Everybody will have forgotten it. I mean, it's been brilliant, so it's still brilliant. We'll, you know, change the direction, add a you know, cool track of today or whatever. And so they don't understand why we don't buy, you know, like stuff that went in 20 years ago, which is a problem. And I really can't buy it. It's like, it's, you know, I, I believe, you know, in the purity of what we do. You said in the beginning that we have to have a new idea every day, which I really love. Uh, what would you say to these guys? Well, I, you know, I, I'll answer that in a slightly different way. I always find whenever I go on uh, juries to judge work, I, and actually I really don't like it, I really don't, I, I try not to go on them now, although I've been asked to be chairman of Eurobest, which I said yes to. But I, anyway, I always get worried when somebody, we sit down and all the jury members go, right, now what are we looking for? We're looking for originality. And I kind of go, ooh. You know, originality, it's such a big word. You know, there's no such thing which is original. You know, God was the last originator. After that, we're all copyists. Um, and I try and use the word fresh. Because in a way, it, it, and I'm not, I'm sort of answering your question, but I'm not, because you, you have to get down to the particular. I have been in that situation. I say, yeah, I have seen it, but what, what are you going to do to that idea to make it fresh, to make it feel different? You can say, <clears throat> it has been done in 1985 and it's got a Cannes Gold line there. How are you going to make it win a Grand Prix instead of a Cannes Gold line? And I try and use the word fresh rather than original. Because in, in reality, nothing can be original, can it? It's an impossible, you know, you know, theoretically, it can't be. Philosophically, something can't be original because it must come, it builds from somewhere else. And then I think you have to ask also the integrity of the person that you're working with. Have they just stolen that and said, oh, we can redo that? Or have they genuinely come up with something and you go, well, it was done like this 25 years ago. How are you going to make it feel different? How are you going to make it feel fresh? And that's the only way I, I try and answer that. But, you know, we are now, our, our, our advertising has a history. You know, and, and we, we're using up all these ideas, so we can't go, I want something completely original. By definition, it can't be. Fresh is the word I use. <clears throat> Last one. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to say exquisite presentation. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to ask, actually, you said that, for example, with the Levis, Levi's, like, example, um, how do you convince your client to take risks with like a really creative um, advertising when you have the time to actually change it? Well, I, th I think one of the things that, uh, and I, is when we set BBH up, we set it up with a reputation that we were going to do very, very different kind of work. And we refused to do speculative creative presentations. We would only do strategic presentations. So, 
when the clients came into us and they listened to what we said, they were kind of buying what it was that we were saying. I think the problem that a lot of agencies have today is they don't believe in anything. So a client walks in and go, and they say whatever the client wants to hear. You know, oh yes, we can do that. So agencies are not brands. They ought to be brands. We, we advise clients on being a brand all the time. But agencies aren't. They're all things to all people. That's why you constantly get conflict. And we were told when we started BBH that it wouldn't work, this idea of not doing speculative creative pitches. But we did it because we wanted to pre-select the kind of clients that wanted to work with us. So by putting a barrier there, you know, it, it was a way of getting them to buy into us. So, you know, if you go in to buy a Porsche and you walk in uh, and you say, well, you know, I'd love to buy a Porsche and I've got a, a caravan uh, and I want a tow bar on the back of the... They say, no, you don't want a Porsche. Go and buy whatever, you know, go and buy a Lexus. So the brand puts up a barrier to purchase because it believes in something. And in a way, the problem we're having is that not enough agencies believe in something. They don't stand for anything. So when a client walks in, they kind of expect a certain kind of work, or they should do, but they don't. So you're having a problem because you're believing in something and maybe your agency doesn't. And that's where the conflict is set up. We've got to set up companies who have a point of view. Not enough agencies do that. And I think that's a great mistake. Thank you. <laughs>